everybody, it is Phil Friedman here, and it's another edition of Friedman Adventure. So great to have you here with us. Do me a big favor while you're here, subscribe and hit that little bell so we can notify you when there are new episodes. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. If fresh water's your thing, my kids are doing Bass Bro, same thing. Go over to YouTube and find them, and you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram also. Today, a really special day because a really special friend is here, and it is Pat McDonald's 34 years as the editor of Western Outdoor News. And you still look good, Pat. I can't believe it. How'd you survive that? <laughs> it was a great job. It was a great job. Of course, I'm retired now from that job, but technically not totally retired. I'm still very involved in the industry and fishing and writing for both Western Outdoor News and for other publications. Uh, so yeah, it's been great. I'm still doing the Baja reports for them and uh, hosting some trips. You know, Puerto Vallarta coming up and hopefully we'll get to a Cedro, so I'm doing an Alaska trip. So I'm still quite involved in writing. I just wrote a feature for Pacific Coast Sport Fishing. and So I'm uh, very active, as active as I can possibly be, given I've been doing daycare for a three-year-old granddaughter and doing some hikes and doing a lot of other things. So uh, I'm pretty busy, and I've got some bluefin on my mind right now, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Heck, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. already coming together. The Polaris Supreme here recently mm -hmm. had limits early in the season. Mm -hmm. I mean, they went out and knocked them down. So, I mean, I follow you, and the fact that you say you're semi-retired or whatever is a joke. I mean, I see how <laughs> active you are and how you keep going. And, man... You know, when you get to our age, people say, keep moving, keep moving. The minute you sit in front of the TV, that's right. yeah. Motion, you're dead. Yeah, that's right. Motion is lotion, baby. So, yeah. Lotion, yeah, that's right. So it's, uh, yeah, and I've been very active. And even though with the COVID situation, although I haven't been on any party boats, uh, I have a pregnant daughter. So uh, we're trying to be very careful about that. So, uh, but I have been fishing with a few select friends uh, who are very isolated as well. So I've been able to go out and go fishing. Bluefin last year, especially, had a great, great time learning the techniques of that. And so that's one thing I'm, I'm really getting into. And among other things, travel and hiking and various other things we were talking about. Because, right. you know, you're, you have you know, the Catalina hike. And so uh, training and using things as incentive. You know, I'm getting, I'm bringing up my boat and I have friends that are get, getting their boat squared away ready for the season. I think we're going to have another incredible, incredible year. I do too. I'm all I'm all over that. Pat, there is so much to talk to you about. We're going to talk about Baja. We're going to talk to you about the biggest stories you wrote at Western Outdoor News. But you just opened the door a second ago. People are catching bluefin tuna now. And you said you took some time to learn some of the techniques to catch bluefin tuna. Let's share some of those with our audience because bluefin is on everybody's mind right now. Mm -hmm. Those big, gorgeous fish. I mean, it's, it's hilarious to me that people say... And the small ones are biting, 40 to 60 pounders. Right, yeah. I mean, I remember a time when 40 to 60, in fact, I have a video floating around mm -hmm. out there. Uh, I forget what it is, but when I was with 976 Tuna about these mammoth bluefin we caught on the Conquest with Skipper Joe Chait, <laughs> these 40 to 60 pound bluefin tuna back yeah. in the day, that was a giant fish today, yeah. people scoffing them. So let's, let's go through some of the tips and techniques that you think are important about catching bluefin from a private boater's perspective, if yes. you like, and yeah. also a guy that's on a sport boat, how important fluorocarbon is and blah, 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 blah. Well, I'm not gonna get into the sport boat things. I mean, you get on a boat, you, uh, you're you at the mercy of, uh, not at the mercy, you're at the favor of the uh, of the crew. And I use the crew uh, as a textbook. You know, I tell them, how do you want to get rigged up and everything else. I've always done that on any uh, multi-day long range trip. Find out what's working, why it's working, and then have, even have the, the crew actually set up a couple of outfits for the really big stuff. Yeah. So that, as Tim Ekstrom used to call it, sano, they sanitized. You know, it was like, what's he got that fish on? And you're pulling on a huge fish, and, he, and and the guy will pull up his finger like that, and he goes, sano. And so, uh, heavy tackle. You know, the, the, the kind of tackle that we're using now is so much more sophisticated than it was in, in the previous years. Gosh, it is. The reason why we're catching some of these big, uh, big fish. Uh, some people come in undergunned and then uh, they end up losing fish. I believe, I'm not a light tackle guy. You know, I believe in going I'm after another guy fish. after my own heart. I love I don't, it. I don't believe in torturing fish to begin with. Uh, but some people get into it and I'm not going to say it's a bad thing. But for me, I like to hit, use the heaviest possible tackle that I can get away with. I do too. Which brings up the, the use of uh, balloons and kites and this sort of thing. And we're really learning uh, on my friends and my boat and I'm learning these techniques as well. Uh, that part of these things I 
used down in Cabo San Lucas and that sort of thing for the, during the tuna tournament and being the director of that so many years I was learning all these different techniques and now the bluefin they perfected in Puerto Vallarta they were using the double, the double treble uh, outfit with the two baits um, and then it, it just the, the way that they were rigging them up now um, is uh, is critical and then just the use of uh, flyers uh, and now we're of course now we're using uh, you know a lot uh, dead baits, you know, and trolling those and just skipping them just gently or just letting them sit out there. And we had a, a couple of really good trips this year. Now, not like Brandon Hayward or something like this where you're, um, where you're catching, uh, you know, fish after fish after fish. There's some guys out there that really know the techniques. And I'm trying to get out once a week, you know, on a boat, picking my spots. I would say the best thing that a person could, uh, could learn is, uh, Go in, look at the videos on the rigging, getting the balloon, getting the helium, and mainly it's information. Where to go, where to set up, and have the patience to stick with the program, which is whether it's a balloon uh, or it's the uh, kite, whatever, and stick with the program. Don't get don't, discouraged. Don't get discouraged, just sit there. And if you don't catch fish, go home. Go home and, uh, and, and go back another day. And understand that it's a process, right? That maybe your first time out, you're not going to get it right, and everything's not going to go. No, we're blocking But it's this process. No, I, we had we had a couple nice big fish this year, last year, and then uh, the last the last trip we took, uh, we had uh, three three huge hits, and one stuck, and I was on it for about 25 minutes, and I had it coming right up. And how big a fish? Uh, you know, I really don't know at this point, but you know, they're all they're, they were all over well over 100, 150, Jeez. and then the one we had was over 220. Wow! But uh, we lost it. Yeah, we lost it. It was just like, a, what did I do wrong? When I drowned. It came up, and the tr the, tr uh, the trouble, the trailing trouble hook um, had uh, come off. That, that whole thing had come off. Yes, yeah. the sleeve wasn't uh, burned the end of it off, and it's like slid through. Lesson number one: always burn, you know, the ends, and then bring it through, which is one thing I learned from Bruce Smith, you know, and my fishing with him. His, uh, uh, the fortunes here uh, yeah, quite often. Yeah, he was my first, that was my first 200 pound fish and he was the guy who said, here's my outfit, Rich Holland, you know, lent me this outfit with my first alarm range up and, and I handed it to him and um, he rigged it up for me and uh, he goes, this is how you do it, burning that end, burning it through the sleeve, can't get out, he says, you don't have to crimp them, so if you use it if you burn them. Didn't burn it. So, uh, and on this one, we lost it. Okay, so I learned that. Also, I learned a couple other techniques. Make sure after you catch a fish and you're gonna send it out and you've used and you've used the low gear to get that fish up, remember to put the gear back in high gear because when you need to get that slack out of that kite line and another, another hit, I didn't do that once and I lost a fish, the next fish. Yeah. So if you don't think that, you have to remember one thing about bluefin fishing is that whatever you think you know, you don't know enough. But the more you do it, the more confidence you have. It's kind of like throwing a, a surface iron. You look in that bag and you look in the bag and you go, which one should I use? What's well, the one that, maybe that's the one that worked last time, you know, uh, because you have to have the confidence to throw it and throw it and throw it and throw it. And you have to have the confidence that your tackle is, is good, your information is good, uh, and you're out there for the bluefin and you have to stick it out. And you can't be chasing after you know, the boils everywhere else. If, if, you, if the fish are around you and you just sit and you wait and get ready, and you don't sit there and talk and you keep your eye you, on the You indicator. have to be observing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's intense. Yeah. But it's also a very relaxing form of fishing, I think. But man, it's so cool, man, when that, when that indicator goes down and you start reeling down and you get this thing and all of a sudden that rod, that big broomstick rod you've got is just bent over and you're like, we got one. Yeah, it's, the adrenaline is incredible. So yeah, it goes from you said it's very peaceful and tranquil. It goes from that to yeah. freaking 120 miles an hour. It is, but meanwhile you're rigging up and you're getting other baits ready because if you get hit, you want to send a, send uh, send another one out right away because you know they're on the bite. Have uh, you ever seen fishing this good before? <clears throat> uh, not for big fish like no, this. No, right? This no. is incredible. Like four or five years ago, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Floyd Sparks, and I went out on my little 18 foot boat. Yeah, it's a Rabal. It's a good boat, but it's 18 feet. Yeah. This boat wasn't uh, wasn't uh, working at the time, so we went out out near San Clemente Island, 18 foot boat, San Clemente Island. I oh, know, I'm not supposed to go out that far, but it was a beautiful day. <laughs> Anyhow, we <laughs> we hooked up 
we hooked up on, I was 135 pounder. Up to that point, it was one of the biggest bluefin that had been caught at the time. They just seemed to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And so we came back with two 60 pounders and, a, and 135. And you're looking on this 18 foot boat. Yeah. And they were sticking out of everywhere. Oh my God. And, uh, yeah. And uh, we, came, we got, came back to Oceanside and uh, the, the, the highway, the, the cops down there, the patrol, whatever, they came I by throw. and yeah. said, hey, so can we fillet the fish here? And like, yeah. And so we ended up giving them some fish and the crowd was around. It was a big deal. Yeah. And my point isn't that I caught the fish or anything else. It was that we caught those fish brought them back and it was a big deal. And now 135 pounder and a couple 60 pounders <laughs> on a private boat is no big deal. Yeah, I know. So they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and I think this year we may see, uh, you know, um, if these fish do move up that are bigger, which I think they will, we'll end up being seeing some 400 pounders. Oh my uh, God. Because we have the tackle, we have the technique. Right. We know we know what we're doing. We're getting guys out there like, like uh, Billy and Brandon and those guys on these big, on these big uh, platforms, uh, they're high speed, they would get to where they are. And the information is critical. I can't emphasize uh, how much yeah, because information is needed. You can do everything right, and if yeah. you're in left field, oh, you don't you're screwed, it, right? right? That's right. So get make sure your tackle's uh, you know, uh, top notch and have a reel that can handle it and a rod that can handle it. And, um, well, that's really thing. Where do you go for your info? Um, well, you know, I have a. You mentioned Billy Kellerman and some of those other guys. Well, you know, I have a friend of mine, uh, Cy Bodden. And, and, and Floyd Sparks and stuff, and they always say, uh, nobody's giving us any information, Pat, because you know they're afraid of, you know, because you'll go ahead and write about it. I, I get the same. Yeah, right? and I yeah. go, I don't write about anything. No. You know? I don't tell anybody anything. I go, how can I be the one? I go, you're the one telling me the, where the information is. And so, but they, uh, when they, they get information, they're sworn to secrecy, and they'll call me up and say, you gotta get on the boat, uh, we're going tomorrow, but don't tell anybody. I yeah, go, I'm not, who am I going to tell? Right, uh, but they're the ones who keep track of this stuff, and they're right. there with all the services, whether it's uh, Buddy Dex or whatever it's called, uh, uh, Billy Kellerman's thing. You yeah, Billy. Sure. Billy does a lot of posting. Fish, uh, dope. fish dope. Fish, fish dope. Yeah, it's good. It's good info. You know, any info is good info, and uh, of course the chloroform, uh, uh, the you know all the all the various mapping features and that kind of thing. Guys are really into that, and so I use those, but. Generally, I just call them and go, hey, what's going on? Well, you know, we're hearing some information, so in a couple of days, get ready, and then we'll go. You've got to go when, which is nice being, you know, kind of retired and that sort of thing. You yeah. Know, you know, you don't have to uh, sit there and go, hey, i got to take a day off work, you know. And I was doing that towards the end. There. It was like, you know, I was like, hey, I'm going fishing, you know. Um, I used to do that same thing with 976 yeah. Tuna, and I would get all this intel, work really hard at getting this intel, but then I would study you know, uh, chlorophyll, and, and especially when we were fishing albacore, I would look for those breaks. Yeah. Like yeah. where that 64 degree water yeah. bumped up against yeah. 59, or even hot, you know, it's 70, you know those albacore are gonna be lined up on that break, What's on the water that What's they What's an have. albacore? Um, we yeah. might find out this year, who oh, yeah. knows? I don't know, some people are still yeah. talking. Yeah. We've been we've been tired yeah. of that. But Jeff Gammons, a good friend of mine, uh, he's had that service for many, many years. Uh, there's some other services out there. Terrafin is the best. Yeah, uh, I uh, mean. Without question, in my mind. Um, it's the most important thing to have in your tackle box yeah. is good info. Yeah, fish dope, great stuff there. Um, and then a uh, guy like Billy, he shares information. He gets, I don't know, four or 5,000 bucks a charter, so it's good for him to promote, you know? It's good for him to promote his gig. The one guy he'll never get information from is Brandon Hayward. Uh, Pretty tight lips. Oh my God, yeah. He's, he is such a great fisherman. Um, all his guys, they, uh, he, you know, he, so I, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I hired him at Western Outdoor News, and of course, and then for, he was sport, he was editor, so saltwater editor for seven years. And then he started his one man charters, and he's built it up into this fantastic business. But he is tight lipped; he doesn't want anybody else. Out I get so, that too. I mean, I going back to Eddie McEwen on the Pacific Queen when I would interview Eddie, I would do an interview with him, and then maybe I was going on a private boat yeah. the next day, so I'd say, "Hey, Eddie, between us, where you know where is this yeah. going on? Where do I want to be at daybreak yeah. tomorrow?" And he goes. This is between us, yeah. Phil, and I'd say 100%. Yeah. The other and when I did that, I didn't share. Yeah. You know, the, once the, you... the other guy that I work with a lot is Bob Vanya of 976 Bike. So mm -hmm. uh, he is invaluable to me and a good, great friend. I'll come back from San Diego or something like that and I'll say, hey, I got some fish. And we'll meet at a place and we'll, get, and we'll share fish. And I'll share information whether it's good or bad with him. And that's important. The bad's just as important. But I don't share other people's information with him. Right. Uh, I only share information that I get myself. Correct. And give it to him. Yes. So that's fair. 
um, because I won't be going back out. Right. You know that the next day. So, uh, and people say, don't share it. I gave the information. When you come back and catch fish, don't share the information. So I will not. So I have to be careful about, you know, the code groups that these, that are I know, because you can groups. really get people pissed, Bob, man. But Bob has turned me on to a lot of great spots. My biggest white sea bass ever. He says, like, Pat, you can't tell anybody. I told him it was for a friend. I told him who you were. And he says, if you go uh, for the white sea bass, uh, you can't, you know, can't put this out. Else. Can't right. put it out. So I went out the day before I went to Puerto Vallarta with my wife. I was like, she says, where are you going? I go, I'm hitching up the boat. I'm going. I got this in- information. He says, we're leaving tomorrow, you know, for Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> I, go, I, go, I, go, I go, I know. I'll, I'll be, be back. back. I'll be back. <laughs> but about 9 o'clock at night, I go, I got a big one. And, um, yeah, and she uh, she was like, oh, that's fantastic. Well, she's got to be used to I, this I, with I, you. I don't know. I showed her a picture of it. I had the boat cleaned up, packed up, ready to go, and we're out the door at 5.30. Where did I go? To Puerto Vallarta the next yeah. day. And where I got a black morrow in my first ever. And I go, wow, was, I've had the best three days of fishing in my life. And I got, I got, yeah. But a lot of it is intel, information, and and and, and just going. Yeah. Can I, 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 can't, I guess I can't emphasize enough to those people who are uh, watching here right now is that uh, today's the day or plan today for going and if you don't you don't catch fish if you don't go and of course it's such a beautiful thing to be out there in the water no matter what that if you don't uh, but if you don't go you know um, yeah it's the, hard to the, catch the grass, them on the, the grass is going to keep growing you know? yeah Even, yeah uh, hard to catch them on the couch hard to catch them on the couch so uh, yeah you got to plan I, that's the thing I, I love about being able to have all this information and friends who are willing to share it and also go with me is that uh, is that uh, it keeps me active? It keeps me very involved. Still, <clears throat> I'm not involved in the day-to-day operations of anything right now, which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. That, that that kind of the grunt work I was glad to get out of. It's hard putting out a weekly newspaper and then dealing with all the other things that go on with it, and managing people. So that was the thing that I didn't like. Oh my God. All the other aspects of that job I loved. Yeah, but 35 years of doing anything. I mean. Uh, <laughs> 30 years of 97610, and I became a helpless, hopeless drunk for a while there. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. It's it, tough. I, yeah. Mean, it, it, I mean, it's looked at as such a glamorous thing, but like on year 33, mm-hmm. you've been there, done that, and not that you look back with any kind of uh, right. bad feelings, but well, enough's enough sometimes. Well, that job was never really a, a, a chore, uh, getting the newspaper out but the uh, making sure that it was done, you know, and, and, and getting it out. I never missed a deadline. It was always went out Monday. And then we had the supplements and everything else. And the website, uh, which they've redone now, is really much better. It's digital edition for half the time. And it's really advancing. But at the time, it was, you know, I got to travel. You know, I got to put out tournaments. Yeah. Um, you know, I got to host trips. Right. Work uh, with great people. There Rich Holland, you mentioned there. Yeah, a lot of great people. So, and I'm doing the Fred Hall shows. I did all the, for all the years that I was there, 34 years, I did the, uh, I did all the special supplements uh, for the Fred Hall, including the show programs for Long, Long Beach and Del Mar. And yeah. Those were my things working with Bart Hall and Fred Hall when he was, uh, when he was right. alive. Right, right. And became uh, close friends with the Hall family. So, a lot, so many great experiences and friendships that have been built over those times. It wasn't just, you know, the grind of putting out a publication. It was all the other things that went into it. Um, you know, the Pete Gray show went on him. He's a good friend. And so, yeah, it's, so it was, all these it's friends a great experience. And, and, they're all, and they're all continuing. Right. It's just that I'm not an editor now. You know, the phone doesn't ring as often for, you know, like uh, favors or needs or information i'll tell you a good rich holland story so rich uh, we were catching <laughs> we were catching i think it was an albacore season yeah. and i invited him out on the conquest yeah so you know you invite rich holland from western outdoor news great guy a lot of fun but you also know you're gonna get like on in western outdoor news that's a big deal yeah. you know huge deal so rich comes out and i you know we want to do the vip thing for rich so I know he likes vodka. I like vodka. I like anything. He doesn't time. like vodka anymore. Okay. Yeah. Well, he used to. Oh, did he quit drinking? Yes. Oh, good for him. Yes. Yes. All right. So anyway, at this time, <laughs> him and I both we both quit drinking now. Um, so um, I had some top shelf vodka, right? Mm-hmm. And I was pouring like a hundred dollar a bottle of vodka, and he's drinking this, and he's going Friedman. Freaking leave it to you, man. Always the very best. And, you know, we're catching fish. And I'm thinking to myself, freaking front cover, Western Outdoor News. We got this now, you know? So I go down to the bunk room, 
and I've got the top shelf vodka, right? And I'm filling it with the thrifty vodka that there was no top shelf vodka. This is the $6. <laughs> and he freaking comes in and he looks at me and I go, oh, hey, Rich. And he's like, what the hell? And I go, well, you said it was the best vodka you'd ever had in your life. A couple <laughs> swings of that, your brain kind of, it, it seems like the best vodka you ever had. Oh, yeah. Great guy. We, yeah. we fished a lot together, oh, did a yeah. lot of fun stuff. And oh, like, yeah. Yeah. it's part of the whole thing with Western Outdoor News. It's such yeah. a prestigious paper, remains so today that mm -hmm. you like to get in. Not too long ago, uh, a year ago, as a matter of fact, I cut that big. A yellowfin croaker, and I sent you the photo, and you got it in the paper for me. And you know, I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, well, it's like, a big deal. Well, Blake Warren, Mike Stevens are the editors. Yeah, now. I've been uh, talking Paul's, to those guys. Paul's Good guys. Down. His wife is ill. I know. So, I yeah. keep her in our thoughts and prayers. I yeah. believe her name is Susan. Yes. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so but Blake is the ed editor, and uh, I hired him. Uh, he was there for three or four or five years, and then uh, when I and then I. Thought he would be the editor, and so they. Uh, but he basically has been running the paper all yeah. along ever since I've been gone. Um, so he's doing a great job. So I always know that if I need, you know, hey, you know, I got this picture. Can you get it in? Uh, he'll take a look at it. If it fits, fine. Yeah. I, I don't ever say I really need this thing in. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. But he, you know, he understands. And if it's if I think it's a good photo and that sort of thing, he'll. You, you might put it in. So, I, yeah. I never have any expectations about Blake as the editor. I knew what it was like being an editor. Yeah, exactly. And, that. and so, you know, but the thing is, the best part was about Rich Holland. You're talking about Rich. Yeah. <laughs> now, he did some he did some amazing work. I mean, it was like 20, 30, it was like 29 years, I think, as a saltwater editor for the publication. And he also ran a Western Outdoors magazine yes. before, we, uh, before we put it down around the 2008, 2009, when the boating industry took a dive. Yeah. You know. Everything took a dive then. So, uh, but he did some amazing work on the MPA, the MLPA program, yeah. uh, award, award winning. I mean, it was incredible. Uh, so, um, but he would never, I said, do you want, uh, do you want to get on a radio show and uh, go on Pete Gray's show and get on there and, and talk about, you know, some of the work? He said, oh, no, no. He was shy about oh, that? Oh, he wouldn't do it. He yeah. wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He says, he was, a, I have to really study and get my notes together and, you know, this. And I go, it's just, just yeah. talk about your experiences of writing this stuff and understanding it. I mean, uh, you should have given him that would, top shelf vodka. He would have gone right on there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he would have done. Anyhow, but yeah. Rich, which was a lot, a lot of fun. We went surfing together a lot. He, we were down in Cabo uh, working the tournament. And he would come down and cover it, and we'd go surfing beforehand. I can't surf anymore, just like he can't drink anymore. So uh, some things change. Um, I can't surf because I have couple artificial hips that can't really get up as quick as, you know, so like a boogie board kind yeah. of thing. So some things, you know, are a little bit different than, you know, as you get older. But um but yeah, but uh no, Rich and I were have, have remained really good friends. And you know, at, at, when we were working together it was always kind of you know, he wanted to do things his way and I wanted things to do my way and so we'd meet in the middle. Yeah. And it was it worked out very well for us. Excellent. I, I can't wait to talk to you a lot about Baja. But first of all, let's talk about some of the biggest stories you wrote and worked on for Western Outdoor News. You can take it in any order you like. Well, I think the, uh, well, you know, when I first got the job there, it was like 1986 or something, we had the El Nino. Wow, that's when I started 9762. So yeah. we both yeah. started our careers in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. wow, okay. The, the fax machines back then. Right, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know. so uh, this is an interesting fact for me, is that I was an outdoor, I was a sports writer to begin with. For with the Santa Monica Evening Outlook as a daily, I was the Corsair sports editor at Santa Monica College, went to San Diego State, was on the Aztec there, I wrote for, covered the Padres and the Chargers for a couple uh, small newspapers up in North County when I got out of college. Uh, Did you study journalism? Yes, I studied, okay. yeah, I studied journalism. And then I got into the outdoor uh, end of it after about four years of working full time. Uh, so I can't kind of like Dave Stray did that also. Yeah, Did you Dave, know Dave? Yeah. Yes. Kind of took a similar Yeah. Path. So, but it was a... Um, yeah, so when I it came on there, you know, it was like El Nino, you know, it was like also I got thrust into this thing of uh, El Nino. And so that was the big story back then. I was learning uh, how to be an editor and an outdoors and just trying to learn how to fish, uh, you know. At, so uh, you hadn't I, fished? Oh, I had fished quite a bit. Yeah. But I mean, Western Outdoor News fishing. Yes. Uh, and, and, and everybody expects you to be an expert in all things, fly fishing, rock hunting, albacore, you know, Baja, come on, you know, there's no one, you put anybody, you know, 
99 percent of the people in the world cannot go to Hawaii and understand exactly how they're fishing right, right there, right. or Baja. I'd say, but some guys, particularly bass fishermen, I would say bass fishermen, freshwater bass fishermen, seem to adapt better than anyone else because they understand the conditions and the tackle and everything else. But most people, they're, they're a fish out of water when they get out of their immediate realm. So I had to learn a lot when I got on the job. Not only just putting out the publication and dealing with uh, the writers and the columnists. Uh, back Tom Miller, Fred Hochter, and hiring people. Oh my God! They're trying, they're trying, to, they're trying to learn uh, all, all about fishing. And one of the things was El, the first big story was El Nino. The, I'd say the biggest, uh, and we covered that quite a bit, understanding uh, what it was all about. And then the albacore went crazy. But the biggest story we had probably was uh, the uh, we got involved with what the Gillnet Initiative. Uh, that was one of the biggest stories I covered. Yeah. I was very involved, and that was on the Gillnet Committee. Uh, in the uh, late 80s, uh, 1990, was it 1999 or something? No, it was, uh, we, we uh, got it passed. Yeah. So we got the signature. Explain a little bit sound. to people who have no idea what a gill net is. Or, oh, well, the gill, the gill net is like a purse sander, you know, so you, they, they, they circle around a school of fish and they pull the net and they pull it together like a purse. So, but they were allowing you know, incidental catches of white sea bass and everything else. They, you know, of course, the rockfish guys were saying, we're just going after a rockfish. No, they would go into the inshore areas and they'd go after the white sea bass because it had a higher market value, but they could do it because it was an incidental catch. And you're getting a lot of non-target fish with oh, gill yeah, nuts, sure. right? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we wanted to get those gill nuts out of way, away from the, the, the shores. And so working with uh, AFCO and uh, you know, a lot of other fishing tackle companies, um, Bill Shed was instrumental in being part of that. Uh, working with Doris Allen, who's now been now passed away, she's yes. an assemblywoman from Cyprus. She um, and she was like a freshman, or just very very um, inexperienced, but she wanted to put her stamp on something, and so she grabbed onto the uh, the Gillnet Initiative, and so we tried to ram that through uh, the Assembly of Water Parks and Wildlife, and so for about two years we tried really push that push that legislation, and it became realized we realized very soon the Assembly of Water uh, Parks and Wildlife Committee which is where uh, it would start there. Yeah. Um, they didn't want anything to do with it. They were dominated by the commercial industry. And so we just wanted to show people that it can't be done the normal way. You, you can't get rid of gill nets through legislation because it's locked up. Yeah. The political situation in, 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 the, in the world, particularly the United States, if you don't have a lot of money, you're not gonna be able to get nothing done. Right. So uh, yeah, if you don't wanna donate, uh, I love CCA, but I don't know if, how, how far we're going to get anywhere on a real strong unless we have some real money. I'd right. love to have some billionaire come in and give us give us a lot of give us a lot of money so we can actually donate to uh, donate. To yeah, it's the definitely campaigns. David versus Goliath. The hand is always out. Yeah. So we couldn't get it passed. So then we went to the Gildan Initiative, and um, and it took it took a lot. It took a lot of money, and. Uh, we had to go into bed with Sea Shepherd and some other uh, things and the dive and we had to get a consortium, a coalition, uh, not just fishermen. Politics makes for strange bedfellows. It, it was the only green initiative, as they said, that, uh, that passed that year, uh, that, that election cycle, and it passed by a landslide. So we got that in. The nets were removed. I covered that for like two or three years, was on the committee. We met every month. And so the idea of Western Doctor News was, and we basically, we took charge of that. Um, anybody who says any different, but I was also able to get a lot of other publications at the time to get involved in it as, uh, as well, which is which was really difficult. Really difficult because they look at the it's yeah, the same it thing now. And I just so yeah. we just sat down. We just said, look, and, and I took a lot of heat actually. Watch after news a little bit for that for cooperating with other things, providing them with photos and working uh, relationships. But I said, look, it's important that we get this thing done and work together, and we did. And so it worked, and it was also the foundation of United Anglers, and then later CCA. Right. Um, but uh, at the time, we were everybody was floundering, you know, as far as trying to get trying to get these nets out. And some of the attitude was, let's not get the nets out. Let's just work on getting sustainable resource uh, management. I go, that ain't gonna work. Right. I go, it's not gonna work. It's a nice pie in the sky thing, but you have to do that through the Assembly of Water Parks and Wildlife, and they ain't gonna let nothing go through. So we got to go through the initiative process, and we did. The nets were out, white sea bass. Uh, the fishing has flourished really, yeah. What we need to do is maybe stop the, the, the pens from uh, existing on our coasts because 
with our supply of, uh, of bait, I think, is, is falling south. So it's, it's going south, trying to feed all these bluefin tuna for the Asian market. Uh -huh. I'm definitely, I'm dead set against that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So there's the battles are just continued, but we have seen a complete resurgence of the white sea bass. And then we started, oh, yeah. and we, yeah, and as, as a result, we were working with uh, the Flager Institute and Catalina, and we started the White Sea Bass Tournament out of Catalina. Yes. Uh, and uh, it was a, we formulated the rules to uh, to show that, you know, the, the resource was back, but we're not going to abuse the resource as well. Right. So you remember the days when catching a white sea bass was like, a ghost. whoa, what, what is that? They called the, the gray ghost. Yeah, but I mean, you didn't see very many when I was a kid. Growing guys, up like, on the uh, guys like Alan Watson, they know. They knew how to do it. But they weren't going to share. You want to get on a six-pack uh, charter boat? That's great. Mark Wish kind of unlocked some of the secrets as well. You really had to know. And Brandon Hayward, again, I mentioned him, incredible fisherman. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, he unlocked even more of the, of the secrets. Uh, but yeah, they weren't catching people weren't catching fish. But a guy like Flager uh, was uh, he would know where to catch them, and but he wouldn't ever talk about it because there were just so limited uh, amounts of them. But, yeah. the, but the fishery has really rebounded. It may not seem like it in the last couple of years. Oh, but, it's, you know, come on, but, it's incredible. But if the, the gill nets were still in the water, those fish that came up from Baja about, what, four years ago? Yeah. When they had that incredible bite. Yeah. They would have all been killed. Yeah, exactly. Gone. Just, you know, so. Wiped out. Yeah. But we're having some cold water conditions right now. Uh, we are uh, seeing an experience. Of, uh, we're going to see a very good uh, recruitment, you know, of, uh, of uh, from the very bottom of the food chain. We may see some white sea bass coming into our into our area like we did before. I end up seeing more salmon actually. Um, so it, it's a great, it's, we're, in a, we're in a great position I think at this point. Uh, and we've seen some good management I think really from the, uh, unfortunately the MPAs you know, were instituted, were locked out of some of the areas, but we're able to, to move around those things. You're seeing the sport boat fleets are able to adapt they said it was going to be a disaster. Um, it really hasn't been. It's been difficult, and I've caught my, I've had to catch myself a couple times from being in those MPAs. You know, I'm like, oh, geez, I'm I know you're almost on the yeah, line. I'm yeah. on the line. No, I'm in it. You know, yeah. and, you know, and I had even, I even got stopped in Catalina once, where uh, the guy says, you know, you're in an MPA, and I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, don't you have the electronics? I go, oh, yeah, I drifted into this spot. You know, it was in Blue Canyon. So, yeah. um, Blue Cave. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but he, you know, professed ignorance, you know, like, man, you know, this is crazy. There's so many of these things around, you know, you people can get uh, busted so easily on these things. But we're able to fish around them. We're able to do, able uh, to fish around them. I just don't want any more. Right. I mean, they, they, it was ridiculous. And then, so the other big story besides the Gilman initiative was also the, uh, the um, marine protection uh, uh, process. That yeah. was just a horrific uh, situation. You can kind of see how we're very vulnerable as a um, fishing community, you know, where money talks um, and uh, people are the crazed people, you yeah. know, I mean, the people who are just so intense on saving the fishery, whether that needs to be saved or not by fit, uh, what, you know, save it from fishermen, you know. Some um, of that is, in my opinion, is a grift and, and it's, it's a way to make money. You it, play on people's emotions, you tell them, if we don't stop these guys, then there will be no more fish left and the ocean yeah. will be polluted and you need to give me money to stop it. Of course it is. Yeah. Of course it is. We know that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that's the way it worked out. Um, yeah, we got left behind. And so, yeah, we had a lot of great air fishing areas locked out that we were not necessarily impacting. Now, I, I do like the four, uh, the, the 14 inch, you know, limit, you know, minimum size on calico and that kind of thing. People are like, oh, that's horrible. I don't think so. I think those are the things that needed to be done. I agree. Uh, I think a know. slot limit would be even better, yeah. but I like the four arm. Anything like that helps. Yeah, but uh, sometimes they can go too far. Yeah, uh, definitely. So, you know, yeah, there's a there's a fine line. We're trying to keep boats out there fishing, keep people fishing, but then, you know, do we have to keep every 12 inch bass, you know, do they, do 11 and a half? I mean, it was happening so much that uh, I think the mindset has to change a little bit. But the fishing has really, I think, gotten quite a bit better for Calico Bass. When I'm out there fishing, I feel like I can get a 14 inch. I'm not going to keep them. But I like to catch them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I love fishing on my 12, my, my, my 18 footer out there and uh, on the pipes and that kind of thing. It's great to take the kids and my daughter. And I'm guaranteed, you know, to catch a nice fish. And I'm using different kind of baits now. I'm learning, you know, how to really uh, target some of these bigger bass. So 
I think the fishing is, is, is really good, but we still, we still have a long way to go for conservation and to protect our resource. And I urge everybody to be really uh, involved and not just join CCA or these groups, but donate money so that they have some money to, uh, to, to, uh, to use. Right, so it's yeah. not so, so much of a David versus Goliath. So then you're not just doing fundraiser after fundraiser. You know the poor. I really wish some billionaire would come in and give us give 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 some money. Who some knows? Money. Maybe one's listening. We got all yeah, kinds yeah, of crazy yeah, things happening yeah, on this need, podcast. Yeah, we need people, wealthy people, to donate. You know, uh, fishermen do uh, are not just out to kill fish. We're out here to, uh, to create you know, conservation and to keep kids fishing and that kind of thing. So, friends of Rollo, a lot of great things in, in our industry are continuing on. Mike Lum is involved in that. Uh, Bart Hall and all those guys. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm very optimistic about the future. Uh, good. Good. You mentioned big bass and you study techniques to catch big bass. Give me a good technique to catch a big calico bass. Well, what's one of the ones you use? Drop down with a mackerel and uh, with a dropper loop uh, or fish it in the tight to the kelp. Uh, big bass like big baits. Mackerel is a Mackerel is a little, little secret for so many fish. A big halibut, you know, big we, bass, we did those, big lingcod. Sorry about the, the the stories that over the, over the years, well, of course, we had the, the, the tournaments. I did a lot of stories about tournaments and started tournaments down in Cabo. But also one of the tournaments we had was uh, down in Ensenada. We did uh, a tournament down there. It was, a, it was Calico Bass. I think it was Calico Bass. Was that when Cal I ran Cal into you that day? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And you I, took us yeah, out? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Joaquin so, Espinosa was there. Yes, yeah. And we had a girl, Deborah, was there with us. Mm -hmm. She had a little too much vino the night before, so she didn't go. How did we end up going fishing with you? Yeah, right. What, did you come to me and say, do you want to go fishing? No, I can't even remember. I think you invited yourself. Oh, I think I did. <laughs> yeah. Just hey, Pat, no, no, can we go fishing with you? Yeah, we Let's go. Vamos a todos yeah. santos. I know. We did. And uh, it was great. And um, But yeah, we, uh, but it was funny. We had this tournament down in Ensenada. Yeah. And so, at the Corral? Uh, was it based yeah, at the Corral? Kim, Which Kim, is beautiful Kim, place. Kim near ran it, and I was like covering it. Yeah. I would do the market, some marketing in the Western Ontario News for it. And he would run it, and I would go down, and we'd have a, we'd have a great time. But the guys, uh, there was a certain number of guys that were really good bass fishermen. And they would come back uh, from their day of fishing, you know, and have these big bags of calico bass, you know, to win that division. So yeah. they had like three divisions. It was like tuna, yellowtail, and and and, uh, and bass. And then the winners of those would go into a drawing for um, an outboard motor. So it was a good. It was a lot. We had 115, 120 teams. I like the drawing aspect too because yeah. so it gives everybody a chance. Yeah. So yeah, they won a lot of prizes for winning first place in each category for calico bass, and then yellowtail, and for tuna, and then all the. Uh, Every single name of the guys on the team would go into a pot, and then that person would win. Uh, whoever came out, he would a one fifty uh, Yamaha. Damn, and it was awesome. So yeah, we had, so we had a lot of people. Uh, so yeah, Kit ran a, it was a great tournament. Okay, so my point is this: is that the guys would always win uh, the Calico Bastard, and they would come in with these lures hanging off their uh, their rods, you know, and they'd come out and they'd, they'd come in, and and I, everybody would think that's what they were using. And of course, that subterfuge. It was uh, they. If you really got up at three in the morning and watched them on the dock, they were catching cal uh, they were catching mackerel, small little mackerel, and then they would fish the, the kelp areas, and they had good specific areas, and they would and they would that's what they caught the big fish on. So yeah, yeah I mean, there's you know plastics, uh, you know, I mean the hookup baits or the with the red rum that are now being made, you know, the little cheaper version of them. Uh, I mean, I love the, the fish traps. I grew up on those. I use those for the bay, but I use a, a variety of things for di different conditions. Um, but uh, the big, the big bass he eat the life mackerel. The mackerel. That's a good one. Huh? Yeah, so and that includes sand bass too. They'll eat anything that's twice their size. I mean, this is you know a mackerel this big, and they'll just big bay, big fish, big big fish. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you know, if I was fishing a, a, a tournaments, and I don't fish too many tournaments, I would uh, most definitely uh, go after go after the go after the wind with the. Uh, with a mackerel. That's great advice. Uh, yeah, but you know, but uh, there's also surface action. I love to fish calico bass with uh, surface iron. I mean, when it's going, oh god, it is incredible. And when it happens, it happens. So uh, you know, that my, that's why I love Baja and Gonzaga Bay. Just got back from there. Yeah, how was that? It was it was a great experience. It's such a gorgeous area. Yeah, when I got back, I called up George Kramer and said, "Hey, I got a story. You know, it's uh, a little bit too much, too big for." Uh, Western Ontario News uh, wouldn't have the room for this thing, so, um, but I, but I did, I'll do the reports uh, on the trip. But uh, I have some great photos. Uh, I can get more. 
Um, and I want to do a feature on Gonzaga Bay and the new road, the Mex 5 road. So right. That's, that's from Mexicali, Dan, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. Mexicali. I need to hear about that. And now, now that road is a 250-mile road, uh, which was just completed last February. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. There's nobody on it, no Canadians. And the Canadians can't get a debacle because they can't get home. So, right. So they all took off when, when Canada announced all their restrictions of travel. And so there's no one, there's no gray, there's no white hairs on the road with their RVs. Wow. There's just, it's an empty road. So you're just going down there, you're driving it, and it's just cove after cove and island. It's, oh. just, oh, it's just a fabulous God. area. You know, it's remote. So uh, even though they built this highway, you know, this, this two lane beautiful highway with shoulders, it's kind of the antith uh, it is the exact opposite of Mex 1, which is you know, the dangerous friggin' road with trucks and everything else. This thing is just a gorgeous uh, road. Yeah. And, and as you go along on the coast, and you're just seeing just beautiful Gonzaga Bay, Portocitos, Gonzaga. It's easy out of Mexicali. The border issue is the only real issue. So, um, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, when you come back across the border, you know, you don't know, you know, they keep changing the damn. Oh, road. yeah. You mean in terms of the time? There's the east west crossing. You're talking about the U.S. Yeah. If, if you, I would suggest anybody who goes to Baja on a regular basis get the Century Pass. Yeah. Absolutely. And then uh, drop people off and then pick them up on the other side. Yeah. Um, that's what we did. So, uh, Chris. Because everybody, it's just to illuminate that, everybody in the vehicle has to have a Century Pass. Yes. So, and, and, if and, they and, don't, and, you and, dump and, them out and, and, and they and, cross and, on foot. And it foot. relates to the car, too. Yeah. But it's easy. You, should, you can get one if you qualify. And then. So uh, everybody should get one, and you can just walk across. It took me, you know, fifteen minutes to walk across. It took me a while to figure out how to where to walk across, but I, I just paid some guy fifteen bucks and he walked me over to the front of the line, and, and you know, I just found some guy looked like a homeless Mexican guy. You know, like, you mean you went to the front of the line? Well, that's pretty good. Well, Chris drove. Gary Poles and I, who's uh, who makes these Pacific lures. Um, so we got out of the car because we didn't have Century Pass, and Chris did. So he took all of our gear and legs, and we ran out of the car. And there was a guy, one of those guys who's, you know, one of these guys are always around the border. You know? Yeah. So like, hey, where's the? Uh, how do we walk across the border? And he goes, oh, come on. So Chris gave him ten bucks, and then he, uh, then he, he walked us around, came all the way around, we came up this bridge. We never found it. And then we we're literally we we're in the line, and then we got out of the car in the line. Fifteen cars out. And then came back, came around, uh, and then came around, walked across, and met Chris on the other side. It took us uh, all of about uh, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So it was like, we just walked inside, welcome to America, okay, bye. You know, like, yeah. It's just like in yeah, the line. And, but you know, if we had Sentry, uh, things we would have been able to go across you know, with him. So I, I recommend, highly recommend. But Gonzaga is a beautiful, in that road, though, it connects uh, all the way to uh, Laguna Ch uh, Chapala now, the 25 miles from Gonzaga to Laguna Chapala, which allows people to go from San, Fel uh, San Felipe all the way through Puerto Cidos, Gonzaga Bay, and then uh, at La, La Ch Chapala, where the intersection is of Mex uh, 5 and Mex 1, 20 more miles and you have the turnoff for LA Bay. You avoid all that coastal yeah, area. Yeah, exactly. If, if you want to avoid that coastal area. Yeah. Uh, it's a much easier drive, much safer, uh, and it's really opened up that <clears throat> entire area. And it'll be a while before uh, it, it, it is developed, but it still it remains the what it, ha it always has been, and there's no one there. And there's no one there. So, so wow. Yeah. So do you, have to, a, do you so, have to take your own ba boat, or are there yeah, guys that are, can you, yeah, can you get on a bonga with a well, guy? there's or? a few guys that uh, that do charter. In L.A. Bay, there's charters. Uh, mm -hmm. Puerto Cito's, no, you got to bring your own boat. Um, Juan Cook is a guy that we've been working with. Uh, he goes from uh, San Quintin to Gonzaga to L.A. Bay. You mean you can... Well, uh, he, he kind of trailers his boat to these areas. So, so if you say, I want to fish, he'll say, I'll well, meet you there. and I'll know, If he's there, oh, you okay. go and meet him. Okay. So he has a regular group of guys that will fish out inside. They don't have to bring their boat. How is he? I hear a lot of great things he's about him. He's great. He's great. Yeah? Yeah, he's great. So, um, yeah, and then you can stay at the, 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 the best place to stay down in Gonzaga is by far Alfonsina's, which is a great little place. Uh-huh. You know. And then there's other little, maybe some Airbnb. Is that a little hotel? Like, or? Yeah, it's right on the beach. Yep. And yeah, what's it yeah, cost yeah. to stay there for a night? Eh, about hundred bucks. Uh huh. And what's the food like? It's excellent. If you bring your own food, uh, for twenty eight bucks, you get uh, you'd be uh, you'll have a round of drinks, uh, food with all the with all of the side dishes, and it was it was 20, 20, for four for four for 
for three people. Oh, wow. That's $27. Jeez. If you bring your own food. If you bring your own fish. Now, if it's not, then it's going to be somewhere around 50 bucks, something like 60 Yeah, you know, still. Because they charge you a lot for the, to get for the fish. So, if you bring your own fish, it's incredible. I mean, we had Gulf Corvina we brought in. We didn't even know how good it was going to be. It was just incredible. And the next day, we got Gulf Grouper, and we gave that to them, and they cooked it, and it was even more amazing. Wow. So, it was two incredible meals. Food is not an issue there. Okay. Yeah, you, know, you can eat at the hotel, and then there's uh, of course at, good, at Papa Fernandez's. They'll cook your they'll cook your fish there as well too. Yeah. So, um, uh, what's nice about having Juan is that he know, he knows all the people. Yeah. And can make the suggestions. So Gonzaga Bay. It sounds so yeah. alluring. So yeah, that that's the thing. And um, I never fished Gonzaga Bay all the years. All the years I fished Baja, and I fished Baja just about every single uh, area. But I never wanted to bring my own boat down to Gonzaga, which is uh, to Bay at uh, Gonzaga Bay. Uh, it's it's a lot, but Chris go down, we met uh, Juan, and then we fished. Now Chris has done a lot of trailer boating with my buddy Chris Wheaton, so uh, so he was just eager to go down and do it. And he has a boat that he's building right now that he's gonna leave down there uh, and and have and he fishes Loretto that whole area. I'm more of like fly in, get a guide, go. Yeah. I don't want to bring a welding unit and, you know, fix my fix my tree. Yeah. Later. But the road is now no longer a dirt road, and it's much easier for people to bring their boats down there in a very three-and-a-half-hour drive uh, down from uh, Mexicali. To Gonzaga Bay. To Gonzaga Bay. Oh, Three-and-a-half three and hours. hours. Sign me up. Yeah. So, wow. Boom. And then you just uh, leave your uh, rig at the uh, at Papa Francis's, and then you go over to Alfonsina's and stay there. And there's a couple places you can stay actually uh, right there. At Papa you, you don't go to uh, San Felipe when you come you from Mexico. Do you, you take yes. five? Oh, you do. You yeah. go to, Me to yeah, San you go Felipe. Yeah, you cross the border at Calexico. Yeah, Mexicali. Uh, once you stop for some Chinese food. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great Chinese food there. <laughs> really, Mexicali. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and then just push through, and then. Um, Get your pesos or whatever you need. And then you go through San Felipe. You go through San Felipe. It's a nice, easy road. Which I love San Felipe. Beautiful, uh, beautiful drive. And mm -hmm. then, boom, you're, uh, you're heading towards Portocitos. And then there you are going into Gonzaga Bay. It's and then 20 miles later, you're going to intersect right there at Max 1. And boom, you're, you can go right down to L.A. Bay, which has charters if you want. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's yeah. The, if you're taking your own boat down there, is it beach launch or is there a ramp? Well, there's that? a ramp, uh, high, uh, medium to high tide, I would highly suggest, at Papa Fernandez's. Uh, you know, if you have a small boat, you know, small boat, you can leave, you can uh, probably do it on the beach if you have a four-wheel drive and all that. Yeah. But, I hope you're asking because you're planning a trip. I mean, that's, but yeah. I would, just go, I would just go to Papa Fernandez's. And, and, and launch there. It's a at high tide or, or medium high. You can just go right directly in. Um, it's it's a like a natural rock, and then they added some concrete. Yeah. So, but they've been launching there for many many years. And then they have a guy who'll take your rig, get your rig, back it in. You know, you call him up, and then you know. So, Papa Fernandez is, is is really the place to uh, to have to launch and, and do your rig there, and then stay at Alfonsina's. Um, there's a couple of suggestions I'd make, but for the, just for the benefit of the, of the larger number of people here, uh, that's the place you want to go. And it's all, and it always been, has been that way. Hell, John Wayne was staying there, you know, uh, was hanging out at Papa Fernandez back when it was a little tiny fish that's camp. That's pretty amazing, isn't now, it? Now, the fish camp ain't much to look at. It's like, it looks like quartzite, you know, uh, you know, you ever seen quartzite? You know, yeah, yeah. Movies and stuff, you know, No Man Land, you know, yeah. the book. Yeah, I like that, though. Yeah. yeah, and then anything that's ever failed or died or or dead, you know, in terms of mechanically, is it's there. there at Papa Francis. It's like Sanford, it's like Sanford and Son, you know, yeah. movie, you know, That's the whole hilarious. TV series. If it died, they just let it sit, including Papa Fernandez's car. Uh, it was a like whole Jeep. It was the last car I ever owned. And I go, you ever want to sell that thing? I'm sure you can probably find some people to buy it. Oh, it's never even for sale. It's it's buried in the sand. It's, it's, it's right there. It's a the, monument. It's a monument. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a picture of him with John Wayne and the, uh, really? in the little, uh, in the little restaurant right there. Yeah, John Wayne was big on in terms of, and, and he he was crazy about Mexican women. Was, also, I don't know if you know that. Yeah, but I yeah. think he had three Mexican wives. Oh, probably around. Yeah, uh, yeah. there's some <laughs> three or five. Yeah. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, there's pictures of John Wayne all over Baja, and he would come down to avoid the uh, the media, uh, and then fly fly in with his friends, and usually somebody with a yacht out in Gonzaga Bay would be there, and he'd hang out there and fish. But he so he also helped Papa Fernandez actually. Um, Purchase his property. Yeah. 
uh, there in Gonzaga. That's a great history. At Punta Willard. Uh -huh. So, a lot of history there, a lot of fun things. What do you catch? Uh, well, and, and we're talking different times of the year. Big grouper. The story was really about going after a world record uh, golf grouper. Which That's what you were trying to do. It was 113 pounder. Well, Chris was going after them. Gary had never caught a big uh, grouper before, so he was going down. Um, Gary, by the way, is the uh, the owner of Pacific uh, Lures, uh, and he's a longtime friend of Chris's. So, um, so the three of us went down, and so they were out to catch the big golf grouper. Uh, I was there just to go and experience it, yeah. and see what it was like, right. and go fish yellowtail. I'm more of a yo-yo grind, you know, like that. But I'll do the. But I, I didn't want to have three big outfits down below and screw up their their game plan. Yeah. So I stayed out of the water pretty much down deep most of the trip, and so we just fished for the uh, the Gulf Corvina for the bait. They're this big. The bigger the bait, the better. Yeah. 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 Those giant grouper. 200, uh, 200 to 300 pound uh, line. A 200 pound leader. Chris was going with a 100 pound, um, 100 pound because he wanted to stay in the IGFA rules and, and bought a, he was basically going to fish for a world record. Uh, God, this is awesome. So he was hanging on for the big boys and he did get an 80 pounder and Gary and Gary got two, 52 and a 44. Wow. Uh, they're a nice fish and they'll be in the story in Pacific Coast. When's that coming out? Uh, probably about a month. It's out now, right? Because well, by the time this airs, well, well, no, no, they got, they got. They well, got, we we're delayed for like four weeks. When I give them, when I give them a story, usually it'll be, uh, you know, it takes about a month. They, yeah, they, and they do a beautiful job. But with it, so. keep going with this. This is so, so bitchy. Yeah. So the idea behind the Gulf Grouper is heavy. A lot of guys get will hook up on going for yellowtail. They, we're at Golden Reef. Uh, we finally got there the second day because the weather kind of held us off <clears throat> the first day. Uh, second day we got them really super early and left it uh, before daybreak and then got out there made some Gulf Corvina um, which are really good to eat by yeah. the way and they use those little dart knife jigs you know of any kind you yeah. know cold snipers that kind of thing and just boom one after another so we had got our limit there threw them in there and we kept uh, like the 10 live biggest for the bait tank and that's what we used with the Gulf grouper and we were and so we we're using heavy heavy line set uh, 16 odd hooks um, and then just hanging on, and you can't just sit there and just leave it at the gunnel, and leave it, leave it in the rod holder. Uh, for Chris, it was like he was hanging onto it the entire time, you know, just like hanging on, ready to go. And then when that rod goes down, you just grind, and then you just grind. I mean, Bill Poole taught, taught me how to catch a big uh, grouper. Uh, he's, he's like a madman. Yeah, at, because at the time that he was showing me this, he was on his boat, Polaris Supreme. Back, back, back then. Yeah, that's a well, way, 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 ago. way long ago. Tommy was Ralph, probably decking Ralph, for him. Ralph Mickelson Ralph. was on the boat with yeah. him. You know, those guys were all gone. I'm getting, I'm getting old. So I'm right uh, behind you there. Yeah. I'm right in front of you. I don't so, know where. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and I saw uh, Bill Poole pull on that fish, and it was like a, a, it was a lesson in, in crazy man. The reason is because they're in bad territories they're bad and they're territory. going to get you back into some <laughs> yeah. structure. So there is also some uh, big sea bass down there, big black black, uh, black sea bass too. So, But these are Gulf Grouper. And so they've, in the weeks since I've been down there, they've been catching now a lot of yellowtail. And I got a 20 pound yellowtail and about a 15 while those guys were fishing. I was just grinding. Uh, one would go, I'm marking some fish, Pat, you know, about uh, 100 feet. So I'd drop the jig down about 120 and just crank, and I got hooked up pretty quick. And then there's not a lot of fish on uh, yellowtail on, the, on that golden reef, but now they actually they have moved into that area right now. So there's yellowtail, there's gulf grouper, there's spike sea bass, there's, and the cabria around the island for the using, they use these Beto seven inch, eight inch long, uh, you know, small lipped, you know, little divers, and they throw them up against the rocks, you know, the various islands down there, which is another experience. These islands are volcanic islands, and they're just incredible. The Encantadas, Enchanted Islands, beautiful places to fish. And all of the reefs around just sounds so It's like there's nobody great. around. It's not like, you know, you've got like 20 boats around. You might see one Mexican boat over there, you know, or some American boats, a couple of American boats, very few. We saw one Mexican boat down there. It was just us on this reef making these drifts and he would and Juan would kind of hold the boat on the drift because these tidal movements in, in this area are up to 15 feet yeah so it's it's crazy so um, so they're um, so we're sitting there fishing these things and Juan would kind of keep it so that the baits were you know kind of straight up and down he would call out the the, the distances you know the uh, the depths and so we we'd bring them up or they would and we'd bring them up and I, I did fish a little bit uh, 
and then try to keep it on the rocks. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be using the, you know, eight ounce, nine ounce, you know, it's only 120 feet, something like that. So yeah. the fact that it's not so deep makes it possible to catch these things. Anyway, Chris was after something bigger than 113 pounds, and he didn't get it. He got an 80 pounder, and Gary got the couple of the smaller ones. Although the, the small ones, I'm talking about the fish this big. So, yeah. Uh, so they were thrilled. Chris got one at the very, very end, 80 pounder, but he didn't get 113. Um, he's, he's, he has about 18 world records, you know, various things. He's kind of a world record wonk. Yeah, really yeah. Goes after him, and I'm more of like I just want to fish. No, I was like, oh, there's a whale, you know. He goes, oh yeah, no, it's a beautiful air again. Yeah. So yeah, I'm more. more he's focused. Yeah, on, he's focused. Yeah. yeah. He's a real student of the game. Yeah. So yeah, we had a great time, and I uh, came back and I told George you got to write about this. This is a, well, a great yes. trip. And the next five, how it's changing uh, travel and movement through Baja and, yeah. and that whole coast, and how people should experience this. And I uh, highly, highly recommend the trip. So when you get down to Bay of LA, then you can pop back out on Mex. You can yes. drive back out to Max One if you want. Yeah, to then you can go to Baja Asuncion. And then another place, uh, uh, Baja Asuncion. Yeah. Great, great place. So when you're coming along, you avoid all that traffic on the coast. Very safe. You pop out there, and then you can continue on to uh, to the um, to the junction of uh, where you drive, where you drop into LA Bay, about forty mile drive down to LA Bay, or you can continue on south. And you're how far does it go? To, south? And you're going to well, it goes well, go south all the way to Cabo. So on, back, the, back on the spot new? No. Oh no. Five intersects with one uh, uh, with one. Okay. At, at, at Laguna Chapala, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Twenty two miles. He just completed the road, so that's went from Gonzaga Bay to La Chapala, uh, Laguna Chapala is the intersection of Mex 5 and 1. Okay. From there, then you continue on south to Santa Rosalia and yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and onward. But also, you're also connecting also to uh, places like Baja Asuncion, you know, this sort of thing. We, we've been trying to look for different places. Mag Bay is starting to open up a lot more to people with uh, trailer boats. Great so, fishing. So, you think you know? You think you've seen it all. You've seen all these areas. There's yeah. so many other more air, beautiful areas to uh, to to go. And the fishing reports I'm getting from these areas are just absolutely incredible. You know, Gonzaga and then the LA Bay is going off. Um, it's just uh, you know we have a fish on Facebook. There's a, a group page called Fish Baja on Facebook, so you should join it. I think Juan oh, Cook, I think Juan Cook started it. You get a lot of great reports. Yeah, there. I use those for some of the reports uh, for Western Outdoor News uh, each week. Uh, without, I use different sources, you know, people send me stuff, people, you know, readers, and also I, I, I purloin information from uh, the Facebook and then I contact them, hey, is it okay if I use this report? And they'll send it to me. So the, the sheer beauty of it, yeah. put the fishing aside, it just sounds like such a great place. Yeah, it's uh, Baja is still very much Baja. I mean, I did a tournament down in Cabo San Lucas 22 years, you know, and I, I went down there so many years, it kind of took me away from some of the more remote areas of Baja. Because <clears throat> I had so much time to be editor and run the tournament and promote it. And How was that running that tournament? It was it was, well, it was great. We started in 1999 with Kit and some other folks at Western Outdoor News and Kit McNair, I mean. And um, and it continues on. It continues on, yeah. Jonathan Roldan is taking Jonathan the role. Jonathan is the director now. And great Chuck guy. Will, Chuck Wahager and those guys are running it. I think they're going to do a great job. Last year was a toughie. Yeah. Chris and I drove down to Cabo San Lucas. Uh, from, from Carlsbad from my, at my house. And we drove down and drove back. First time I'd ever done that in, uh, during doing the tournament. Um, I'd done the trip three or four other times, but I only, but Chris was like, well, let's drive down. You know, oh, okay, let's drive down. Let's make an adventure, it's your last tournament. So he'd never seen the tournament before. And when we got back, I said, of all the COVID restrictions and no groups, no, no, no parties, it was just sign up, da 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 da. I mean, yeah. You did not see the the tuna it was like a little sterile this it time. Was, huh? Yes, it yeah. was tough. And, yeah. and, and and Chris worked his butt off, as did the rest of the staff, to make it happen for the fitty anglers. And we had 134 teams, I think. 100 and, wow. Like 140, 150. I don't know, I forgot. You know, I don't have to keep track of that stuff anymore. But it was, uh, we broke the record for the amount of money uh, that we paid out. And what kind of dough do you pay out in that tournament? Uh, it was a million, million, like million one. Wow. Yeah. What's yeah. it cost to get into it? Oh, well, it's a thousand bucks per team. And uh, then you got side pot. 500 of that goes into the pot, and the other 500 goes into hats, shirts, bags, put it on, da da da. Yeah. And profit. Uh, then beyond that, it's uh, it's like the Bisbee's. You pull it, you, you go in, there's it's two days of fishing, and then you get into. Uh, 
the optionals, which is in the order yep. of uh, 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 and 500. Is, if you can afford it, is that a good idea to get in those? Oh, would I you think say? so. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people have- That's where you get the big money, right? Yeah, a lot of people have uh, you know, gotten big fish that didn't even win the tournament, and then had they had they been in one of the optionals, a couple of the optionals, they would have won you know, over, well over $100,000. So it's kind of like going to Vegas and do you want to be on the quarter uh, table or do you want to be at the dollar table or the $10 table or the high stakes table? Yeah, right. Whatever you're comfortable with. I think the main thing is to go down and have fun, and that's what the success of that tournament was. Come down, have fun. Well, you know, um, it's clean. You know, we don't bring in, you know, we never, you know, brought in, uh, you know, uh, strippers and girls and, you know, did the kind of Pelagic came, like, came down there and did the tournament once. You didn't do that or you did? No, we did not. Oh, well, we kept, I'm out. No, I'm Yeah, uh, we did it. We did it because we wanted, to, we wanted wives, girlfriends. And if, yeah, I if, if guys want to go down and party, if people want to go down and party, they can go down. They, they go over, over they, Squid Row and they, do whatever. They, they can do whatever they want. They can find whatever they want. Yeah. And, yeah, but you still have pretty girls when the guy gets the award and everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah did mom, your wife mom, give you crap about that ever? No. No, she came down and helped me, helped me with the tournament. Oh, okay. uh, she got uh, she got pooped out and she understood the, the stress level that, that it was under. Um, so she stayed home for most of the years. But for about five, four, five, six years, she's of the 22 years that I did it, she was she there. Got she was there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, between the kids and grandkids and yeah. everything else, but she came down uh, about three, about two or three years ago, uh, the year before I stepped down. I stepped down last year, this last event. Um, and she said, you just work too hard. You need to you need to slow down. You know, this is too much. And I go, yeah, you're right. You know, I don't want to end up <clears throat> with a stroke. Right. Uh, it's just very, I put a lot of pressure on myself for that tournament, uh, trying to make it happen. Yeah, because that's a monumental Yeah. So I undertaking, looked, right? Yeah, it is a monumental. It's, a, it's an all-year deal. You're yeah. You're trying to make it special for the sponsors and the staff and... Uh, you know, because you because you are hiring participants, you're, you're everybody. Well, of course, the participants yeah. is always the number one thing is yeah. to make sure the participants are happy. But with the COVID thing, it just took uh, some of the. Uh, yeah, it, let's face it, you know, it's not easy putting a tournament on. You know, when you got to wear face masks. Yeah, it's a pain, this. right? And I planned an entire tournament, and then Mexico switched everything around, and then it ended up being really just a, a tournament. It was a great tournament, but it was just. Not the award ceremony, not the fiesta, not the dinner. Right, the that's all part of the. No one could come to the weigh in. We did it remotely. It was, it was very tough to to, to undergo that, but it happened. It was successful, and uh, it worked out great. Right, and then You're we, we, we packed up and I went home and I gave Jonathan Aldon twenty pages of uh, called the cookbook, uh, which he he had already done the tournament many many times. Yeah, he'd, he'd helped me many many years. So he he's from Tail Hunter, he, uh, yeah, by the way, Jill, in La Paz, Jill and Jonathan yeah. uh, already knew about the tournament, and they had been away for a couple of years, and so they hadn't seen, you know, how I, you know, done different things with the stages and the various things. So I had to write out a, a thing of this is how it will be if they allow parties and, and gatherings. So he he is on it. He's uh, uh, he's already on it, and I they sent him the information uh, over the course of a couple of weeks, and then he's asking more and more questions, and I'm happy to help him. What time of year is this but tournament? The, you know, the publication, oh, but you know, the publication is running the tournament. With yeah. Jonathan, Jonathan, uh, um, of course, has his own business. So yeah, there. The tournament is the biggest tuna. I just want to say this: the tournament, tuna tournament is the biggest tuna tournament in the world. That is amazing. Okay. And we ran it Western. It's a Western Ontario News event. Uh, it's not a Pat McDonald event, uh, but it was a big part of my life. So that you're talking about things that you're reminiscing about the big stories. Well, I had a market. You know that that thing for twenty some years, getting, yeah. people, getting people to go, and you know you got to figure there's always some attrition. But one of the things I did was in the very beginning was I had a website, uh, and now it's I, I think they're not using the website or updating it now, but it was Wolves Cowboys Tuna Jackpot uh, uh, dot com. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and so it's still there, but they're not really updating it too much. But the but the website was the way to reach people from around the world. So we were getting teams from Japan and Brazil. And sure. Thing, you know, but mainly Cabo San Lucas, because not everybody reads the Western Doctor News. At the time, we didn't have a website. Uh, back in 1999, we didn't have a website. But a friend of mine, I met on a long range boat, on Tim Ekstrom's boat, the first time I ever caught the long range. Uh, the Royal long Star. Long range tuna, with my first 200 pound tuna, I met uh, Bill Grimsley. Yeah. Who was just starting out uh, taking domain names and then creating the website for, yeah. uh, for a pipe company that he worked for. Yeah. 
and he ended up parlaying that into his own company. He left the pipe company and started his own and, and built websites. And he said, he did that for me for free. He says, Pat, you've got to have a website. This is the future. This is before Fisherman's Landing had a website. Yeah. You know, I mean, Doug, Doug Kerr will tell you when he started his website. I think the Zoom terminal was right around that time. When yeah. People were just going, well, we got to get into this. Yeah, in what case is it, this? In, case yeah. it, in case it becomes something. Yes. And, uh, but Bill was like, got to do it. And so over years, he just let it, he just ran it for me for free. Oh, you know, wow. I just, I just sent him the information. And so that really, that, then the newspaper, uh, uh, of course, Western, the power of Western Ontario News, we had 112 teams the first year. But to get people to go again and again and again and then fill in the gaps of people who have who's, who's stopped sure, them, sure. You, lose, you lose about 20%. Uh, Did then, you have to address yeah. the fear factor of people? Because, I, oh, well, I mean, what? how many people say to you when you say, I'm, I'm driving to Cabo, they're like, oh my God, don't do that. Well, I mean, and they're always the people who have well, never been people, down there. Well, most people flew down and then chartered a boat. Yeah, charter, but I mean, still, people are afraid to go to Mexico. You don't get that? For sure. people? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get it all the time. Like, I'm insane yeah. and I shouldn't. And it's like, what? I've been There's, doing this for 55 years. Well, you know, the, the only time you're really, the only danger is if you drink too much and go fishing. You break, you break a leg, you know, in bad weather, you know, like this, or you get drunk or you get, you know. Yeah. You pick up a, uh, it's just, it's, you know, you can get. <laughs> pick up a what? Pick up a what? Never mind. A uh, six pack? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Six. I thought that's what you were thinking. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, uh -huh. you know, you can get, you know, you can find, you can find trouble wherever you want, but the. Uh, that's it, true. But, you know, you can get, you know, the, and, and for, let's face it, you know, in, in Cabo, you know, they're, uh, they're pretty good about dealing with Americans. You know, they understand, you know, the staggering American, you know, is, they just, uh, sir, you need to yeah, go to this way or, yeah. They're not going to do anything. Right. But uh, I've never had any trouble ever. Me either. Uh, down there in 20 some years. And of course, I always respect uh, the laws. Yep. I respect the, the Mexicans that are down there. Yep. I hired locally. I did. I worked as much as I could and hired local people. And I treated them with respect and became a long time friends. With sure. Them. So funny how that works. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> you, treat you treat people decently and they, they respond. Yeah. I didn't try to grind people on their price. Yeah. You know, and we're talking about vendors and you know, all kinds of vendors. And so, yeah, a lot of these people, it was very sad to, to, that I'm no longer working with them, but we still keep in touch through Facebook and, you know, I just see their birthdays are coming up yeah, sure. or I'll email and say, you know, and then when the tournament gets closer, I'll just say hi to people. Right. So, uh, uh, but I won't be attending the tournament. I was thinking I was going to uh, fish in it, but I'm not going to do that. No, why not? Uh, I, just think it's, I, I think it's just better just to leave leave things oh. alone for at least a couple of years. And if yeah, I want to go down, and, if I want to go down and fish it, uh, then I'll be nobody will really bother me too much. But the first year, let Jonathan and everybody run the tournament, and to me not having anything to do with it is wise. Yeah. Linda, my wife, was suggesting that the first year back, uh, you shouldn't go down. Yeah, that's a good idea because um, yeah, it could turn into a thing too. Where oh my God, what do we? Hey, there's Pat. Get him over here. Hey, Pat, uh, you know, we're gonna get. I don't want to do that. Yes. So, uh, so I'm yeah. going to do the uh, Van Warmer tournament. Uh, oh, cool! There, the uh, going down for the. Uh, uh, I love Palm the Toronto Toronto shootout. Chucky Van Warmer. Hey, Chucky! Yeah, great so guy. I'm going to do that tournament. Kit, Kit runs that tournament, so it'll be just fun just to go down there and have some beers and go fish for Toronto. Sure. Oh, it's a it's a uh, it's a low key thing. I'm nobody down there, so it's nice just to be incognito and not have to. You know, there are a lot of people I, I'll know down there because they do both, all the tournaments, but. I was doing but a if live casual. I wouldn't have to be involved. In I was doing a live radio show with a sat phone. Yeah. To Angel Stadium mm -hmm. from Palmas de Cortez. Yeah. Couldn't get a signal, so they say no signal, right? And Chucky Man Warmer goes, Felipe Tequila, <laughs> right? So I had forty-three shots of tequila. Yeah. And they go, Hey, we got a signal, and I'm like, You gotta be kidding me. Yeah. I I I never ever somebody goes, You oh my god, what uh, 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 you know. And you gotta listen to that. I never yeah. listened to that. That must be floating around out there somewhere. Yeah. I, I never let. I didn't even want to freaking <laughs> hear it. But Chucky, Chucky's a great guy. And Chucky Palmas is great. Warmers, Eddie Dalmau. Eddie man, loves that. What band. we have behind you. Oh yeah. The He's man making warmers, man. Man warmers are bought a royalty. I mean, yeah. And, uh, you know, in, you know, they uh, politically they're very impressive. And Chucky, of course, won the tournament uh, one year. The tournament. Mm -hmm. The tournament. He entered it once, I think. I think no, no, maybe twice. And he, uh, I mean, kind of like a 300 somehow fish right off the bat. You know, he's, he has a really hell of a good crew. Yeah. Understand? And they, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was great. He, 
he, the, the guy is either the best fisherman I know or the luckiest. I don't know, but he is incredible. And he's every almost every tournament he is he's in contention. Yeah, so, uh, he's a lovely so, guy. Yeah, he's he's a good guy. And I guess he's a senator now. I guess he's uh, he's a member of uh, Congress or something now. So he's very really uh, a good uh, uh, good family, and they are uh, doing a great job. And they have three tournaments down there. They do they do a ton of other tournaments. But the uh, the three main ones are the Wahoo Tuna and the, the first one is the Dorado. Yeah, and we we were down there for a lot of the the year last year in July, and we we're staying at a house down there by a buddy of mine, and we were going to enter the tournament, and we, there were no boats available anywhere. I couldn't even find a boat. There were 119s at a time when uh, right in the middle of the COVID situation, they just opened just opened two weeks before they just opened the hotel, and. Uh, and I was like, I didn't think that many people would be down here, you know, that we'd be able to get a boat easily. That there were 109, 109 teams in that Jeez. tournament. Normally it's like 140 teams. Yeah. But 109 teams, I was flabbergasted. And I go, if they have 109 teams, I think we're going to do fine on the Cabo tournament. Yeah. And it turned out that people just wanted to play. They wanted to come down. Yeah. They they're willing, and they're willing to put up, try to try to feel normal. And so that was the first indicator, I thought, that things were going to be okay. Yeah. But also the restrictions were very intense. And uh, if you do go to Mexico, you're going to have to get tested when you, before you come home. Well, if, if you're on a flight, right? If you're on a flight, if you drive, you don't, right? No. Right. But, if you, but I, I would just suggest you do anyhow yeah. uh, when you get home. But uh, I'm double vaccinated. Yeah. So, uh, but no, it, the, the restrictions and everything were very, very. Tracy Ehrenberg of uh, Pisces, Pisces Fleet was incredible. You know, she um, is awesome. Down there. Yeah, she's fantastic. I don't think we could have done the tournament without her last year. I believe that. She is so all great. The restrictions and all the paperwork and all the things, all the subtleties. I just put my hands, my, my the, the fate of the tournament, Chuck and I, uh, Hodger and, and Lori Twilliger, just put the fate of the tournament really in her hands. Her and Marco, incredible job. So I just love all the people with Baja. And Me I love, too. I love reporting on them. Uh, you know, but I also stand, understand it's a business and that, you know, that I don't expect anything, uh, you know, no big favors. It's just uh, coming. But it was very emotional enough to, uh, in the last part of the tournament last year, to say goodbye. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. 22 years? Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. Even Tracy got a little emotional. She goes, I'm, I can't believe I'm crying, you know, like this. I goes, I'm not going to be able to work with you anymore. You know, like, it's like, oh, I'll be back down, you know, I'll be fishing. And yeah. But no, just we had a good, we had a good run. And now it's, your guys are going to take it to the even greater heights. That's fantastic. Um, Have you ever fished with Wesley in the surf down there in Cabo? You know who I'm talking about? No, I did a, a story. Um, I never I, I never fished with Wesley. I have reported on some of the incredible catches. God. Was huge pargo. Yeah. And roos, it was a rooster fish. Roosters had. and Dorado and, um, and you name it. Yeah. He's, he's just got fishes, a dial there. He fishes off the rocks there. A great guy. Very Christian. Um, Great family guy, and he is the guy to go with. Cabo you gotta surfcaster. Up, you got to get up at five, four, three in the morning, two in the morning, three in the morning, and then it takes you, and then you fish fishing yeah. right at daybreak when yes. the fish are on their feet. Yeah. You can't wake up and have your little uh, coffee. No. And go. you got to get up early, get on the beach, and you're throwing. Yeah. And um, Incredible catches. Yeah. And, yeah, and he's, you know, I, that's I, that's I, I love doing that kind of stuff, but I never really connected with him, but I did a big story uh, about him. Uh, and also do a feature on a magazine feature um, about him as well. He's a very nice guy. I talked to him yesterday. Yeah. Fact. So yeah. I incorporated him into a story about snook because he, he got a huge snook uh, just north of, of Cabo um, while uh, fishing from the rocks. Yeah. So, yeah, Mag Bay, I did a whole story about snook and Baja and all that kind of thing because it's a unique fishery that people, you know, kind of like the great ghost thing. Yeah, about. right. Sea bass. It's like, where do you go? How do you catch them? And there's some people in the know, and there's a lot of us that are, that are not in the know for big ones. And Wesley, you just start throwing and throwing and next thing you know, you get a big grouper or a big rooster fish or a Jack Creval or whatever's out there. And in this case, it was a huge uh, snook. Oh was, my and God. Was, yeah, we did the, had the beautiful pictures. And so he cooperated with that with that story. There's always fun stories. It's like one thing you think, you know, if you're covering as a journalist and after a writer, you know, you just uh, follow the stories. Gary Graham, is uh, one of the great uh, outdoor writers, you know, in our industry. And besides the fact that he's absolutely a phenomenal fisherman uh, that goes way beyond, like a lot of people understand, you know, that he was like the lastly of, uh, of, of uh, marlin fishing. He was winning most of the tournaments, you know, back when he got bored with it. Yeah. <laughs> and then this is a guy that he goes into, delves into his things and he's just good at whatever he does. Right. Uh, but he is epic fisherman. He's just one of the best fishermen I've ever known. 
and uh, most casual and low key about it. I mean, it's you would never you would never know. You know, still waters run deep. The guy is incredible. Yeah, I mean, the, the well, and he's such a fun guy to fish with. Um, and he was down there covering, helping with the tournament, and I hired him to do a lot of the Ba stuff too. The right, he's now making working mainly with uh, Bloody Dex. Yeah, uh, doing those reports now. So um, yeah. we're we're getting a little bit low on time. We have a little bit of time. This is just flying by. Well, I can't well, believe it. But I want to ask you. You just mentioned snook. How do you do it? Uh, Where do you do it? Oh, well, actually, can you just give it, or is it too too much? It's too much. Okay. Uh, you know, is, is there, are you writing an article, or well, did you do something? I did one for Pacific Coast Sport Fishing. Okay. So, Tony Pena, you know Wesley, uh, you know, the guys at Mag Bay. There's so many places to go catch snook. I'd say that one of the biggest stories I've ever did at West Hunter and it was, yeah. really was about the Eric, the sinking. Uh, this oh is, my this, God. This is the 10 year anniversary of when the Eric. Uh, what, what's the date of that? July 3rd, 2001. So tell people who are not aware well, of it. was the an Eric's, awful the, day. Uh, the Eric, uh, two the, weeks before I was to charter the damn thing, go down and be the charter master. Really? And said, hey, Pat, the boat, uh, you're, the, you're not going on that charter. I go, why not? He goes, oh, it sank. It went from San Felipe, caught cotton to Chabasco, sank about three miles off of uh, Gonzaga Bay when I right. tried to go back to the shelter of Gonzaga Bay, went with the swell, not uh, the swells swamped the boat, you know, short story, eight Americans died, all the Mexican crew made it. Uh, they all had life preservers, and none, none of the Americans were given a life, life preservers. They were all stuck down below. They couldn't get to them. You know, eight, eight people died, seven people were lost, uh, bodies were lost. Uh, were not recovered initially, uh, but they all came around the, uh, the Enchanted Islands of St. Louis and came around and a lot of the debris washed up. Yes. Anyhow, they, but through the help of uh, various Americans living at Punta Buffeo, um, because the boat had no electronics, it had no electronics whatsoever. It's one of those mid-drift boats that went from San Felipe out past Gonzaga and then went out to the mid-drift islands. Was that a Tony Reyes son? No, 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 no absolutely not. not. Okay. No, no, it was another guy who was, ran the Santa Monica and then he had another boat, but no, Tony Reyes, no, absolutely not. Those boats are absolutely safe. Yeah. Uh, and, and as a result of this sinking, which was quite embarrassing to the Mexican government. Yes, it was. <clears throat> they, uh, they instituted a lot of uh, new regulations as a result. It's the 10 year anniversary of the boat sinking. I remember, and yeah, I eight, covered that. So eight men died, uh, yeah. one, uh, one was uh, found dead, floating. Uh, he washed up, or they found him floating. Uh, he died, and the other seven were lost. Three people were trapped in the boat, and a year later, they located the boat and dove and recovered the remains of three of the men who were in the stateroom, which was down below. The water rushed in; they couldn't get the door open. Obviously, the boat in three minutes, the boat went down. Yes, very quick, and within five minutes, it was flat calm out there in the middle of the night. People had to fend for themselves, hanging out of coolers. And right, I interviewed it. Was, it, was, it was harrowing. Quite, quite dramatic. Yes. Uh, so yeah, and so it's uh, next year will be the anniversary when they actually recovered uh, three of the bodies. And the stepson, uh, Joe Jacino, uh, of one of the men, um, he wanted to fulfill his uh, stepfather's wishes. A Vietnam vet, you know, uh, wanted to be buried in the west, uh, in the uh, Western Sierra. So he went and dove and uh, dove the boat with the help of a Navy diver and some other uh, dive experts, dove down, very dangerous. The boat was draped in nets it's in 175 feet of water. Uh, this was in 2012. And um, they recovered the three bodies. Basically, they, was, Remarkable. they were just throwing, you know, they were in there. I don't think they were in fully clothed. And so they were just putting whatever they could into the three bags and yeah. they came back and they did the DNA on the three men. And, they, and he did bury his, uh, well, his, that's uh, his, uh, step, uh, his stepfather's uh, uh, remains in the Western Sierra. But it was an incredible, uh, dangerous dive operation. So I did major stories on these things. Um, basically, it always these stories always seemed to develop just when Lynn and I were going on vacation. <laughs> so so I had, people would call me up and say, Pat, I don't So the, when the boat initially sank, I couldn't have no story. And it ended up just going to the, uh, to uh, with Linda up to the Eastern Sierra State, a beautiful, nice uh, place up there, the West End or whatever it was, up there. And we're having this beautiful uh, little getaway. You know, normally you know Eastern Sierra, you think of cabins and that kind of thing. Yeah. And Linda wanted to go to a nice place, and I get this phone call from a friend a friend of mine, uh, and says, you know, one of the guys who was in your tuna tournament was on that boat, Jerry Garcia, not the Jerry Garcia, and uh, he was on the boat with him, and he and he survived. He went down with the boat and then came and popped back up after he just got a, you know, one of those SOS preservers. On yeah. It and made it. 
he's coming back. He'll be at his house. He'll be back in, in near San Francisco uh, soon. Uh, she give him a call. He knows what happened. All this other stuff that's going in the media right is a big fat lie. He goes, he goes. We know he knows why it went down because he was on the deck when it went down. Jeez. And it was crazy. He's I got a hell of a story. So I call up, and Olympia goes, "Go for it." You know, we're sitting there. You know, this beautiful, you know, beautiful room. You know. And I go, okay, so I had my computer with me because uh, I was doing a little bit of work uh, while I was there at, at Mammoth. And then it turns out I started interviewing Jerry and just put him on speakerphone and I started typing. And then he gave me the names of other guys and so then I, and also uh, the rescue guys, uh, Doug McGee, um, uh, was and Dave Kalicki were guys that lived in Punta Buffeo and they actually went out and were rescuing these guys the next day as these people were floating in this big debris field that came out around San Luis Island uh, and came in and then uh, ended up on the beach. And uh, there's a memorial we stopped in Bummer and Gonzaga Bay. We stopped at the memorial. There's a five year memorial. Oh, I got there. Go. I would like to go pay my respects. Yeah, I'll show you the pictures when we get done. Yeah. Uh, of it. But the, uh, yeah, but it's it's in the middle of a remote thing. You'd have to know exactly where to go. Uh -huh. uh, where, and I wrote about it in, in the Pacific Coast uh, uh, story. When it comes out, you'll see it. I can't wait. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll, people really want to see it. They can drive the one mile off the next five and then go, and there's a big cedar tree. and there's and the, and the memorial is with one of the pongas that came up and ended up on the, on the wow. beach. Wow. And, they, and they did a plaque after five years. The family came down and did a little memorial service. So Juan Cook knew about it and says, you got to see this. You wrote about it all those years ago yeah. because he's been reading Western Ontario News for many, many years. He goes, you've got to see this. So he did it. And so uh, we saw that. And Chris and Gary and I, we saw that. And, we, and then we drove home. It was very sobering to remember that whole thing sure. uh, and the deaths. And of course, I could have been on that boat. Um, because I was charter master on boat on the boat two weeks later, so uh, and I ended up covering it, and so I ended up doing a huge story about it, uh, writing about it, and then the rescue. Doug McGee who was the postmaster in Mammoth, was living in Punta Buffeo. The Mammoth Times did a little story oh, about wow. him having done the rescue, and I was at uh, I was at Silver Lake having breakfast with Linda, and I was trying to was formulating the story as I heard about it, you know, and we're still trying to make a vacation out of this while I'm writing the story. And I go, oh my God, Doug McGee, you know, is down there living at Puna Buffet and he was part of the rescue guy. These guys were all, Mexicans didn't rescue anybody. It was Doug, Dave Kalicki, Doug McGee, who was coordinating the whole thing. And the Mexicans basically were just transporting people out and trying to keep the media away. So, and then trying to, you know, keep the information, you know, about what happened. And because uh, it was kind of embarrassing that eight Americans died and okay. no Mexican crew, so uh, so the, the, so I ended up getting the whole story. And I was reading the Mammoth Times while I'm having breakfast, and there was and there was the story about Doug McGee. Oh, yeah, Doug McGee! If you don't know, oh, the, the, this was national news. Oh, I know. Well, I know. So I also I pick it up. And I go, Linda. I go, we got to call Doug McGee. We got to get a hold of this guy. So I threw another friend. I contacted Doug. He called me up. Your vacation and, turned into a work. I, it turned into a five-day work. Yeah. And I was writing till like all night long, and then I sent it to Western Hunter News, and they weren't sure they were going to run it because they didn't know about the legality of it. And, was, and I said, "It's." So we turned it into a column. I turned it. I said, it's okay. I go. So I wrote an initial story, and then I said, "It's. It's all there. It's all their story." I go. So um, they ran it. It was a. Um, I was like, I don't know. Uh, it was, ended up being um, two or three. Almost a full two to three pages. Yeah, uh, and then um, uh, and then then other two stories I did about the finding of the boat and diving on the boat were another two page color uh, features a year later. So I wrote a lot about it uh, in follow up. So that was one of the big bigger stories I think that I did, uh, <clears throat> and it always seemed to come when I was on vacation. I know, you know yeah, right? because I even even the finding of the boat and the recovery of the bodies those were done on another trip when it was you know. What we're on a trip, and it's not a lot. You can't ignore a breaking news story yeah, if it's yeah, you, know, you got to cover yeah, it. Yeah, it's part of being a, a writer and a journalist. You got to hit it. You got to hit it. But uh, but yeah, the information was it came to me through the sources, many sources of Western Ontario publications. Yeah, and uh, and through the tournament, tournament, all these things are related. Yeah, as you know, a lot of these things happened in the industry. You know, you develop this core. Any writer, any journalist, particularly investigative journalist, has a core of sources absolutely and they come in many many different forms and so that came to me and uh as a result of writing the story um i get a lot i got a lot of interest in a lot of people say can you speak for the groups and this kinds of things and 
Um, so I ended up doing a lot of them until finally I just decided to say no. And I don't want to uh, write, do any more. Um, it's just it actually got a little too emotional for me. Yeah, I, I know. I know exactly what you mean. That was, so, I haven't thought about that story since. Yeah. I so can see it, you're it, tearing and, up and, and, and it always seems to come back to me. Yeah. Um, and there's many, I, I know we don't have enough time here, but it's just the story keeps coming back to me. Um, that, um, you know, I, read, I was reading the San Diego Union, a guy named Dale Pearson uh, was a, was in some music story about, you know, some music program down in San Diego, and he says he's a former Navy diver. He was one of the divers who dove on the bodies wow. to find the bodies. Wow. So I called up Diane Bell, who did the columnist for the San Diego Union about four or five days ago, and said, could you have Dale call me? I yeah. sent him the copy of the story. I don't know if he ever got them, but uh, if you could let him know that, uh, you know, here's my phone number and you can contact him. But, but it's a 10-year anniversary of this thing, so if you want to do a story about the recovery of the body and Dale, Who's a San Diego resident? Yeah, next year, you should call him up, and I'll give you I'll, I'll give you some photos, and and you can follow up on it for the San Diego Union because he's a local resident. And he dove on that boat, and it's a very dramatic story. And then, of course, other people have said you should write the book, write a book about the whole thing. And uh, that would take about a year of my life. Yeah. And do I want to do that? I don't know if I want to do that, but um, but. Um, but so far, nobody's ever uh, has not written about it. Yeah, it'd be a great story. And many uh, authors who have uh, uh, contacted have contacted me uh, have been have been interested in writing that. So it's a uh, it's a it's a dramatic story. The dramatic story isn't really about the sinking; it's about the steps and uh, yes. searching for the boat. That's a not beautiful find story. Over three or four trips down to Baja, using nitrox to go down and dive, and then using radar to find try to find the boat. I remember they this. Finally, found the boat. Then they dove on it, and it is a dramatic dive, very dangerous. As I said before, in Gonzaga Bay, uh, you have uh, the tidal flows are so incredibly yes. uh, strong down there, which makes the fish fight or bigger, or bigger. They're better fighters down there um, because of this uh, strong tidal flow. That uh, diving on this thing is that if one person, as they were going down 175 feet to the boat, which was draped in hooks and line and nets. Extremely dang, I had to cut through the nets, and then they, went, they came back up, then they dove again, and they, and they went into the thing, and they had to go into the stateroom to get these guys and bring them back up. And there's footage of it, and there's, and there's photos. What a remarkable and, and so, story. Yeah. So Dale was one of the Navy divers. He had the experience, and they were mixing nitrox and other, you know, for the, for the deep dives there on the beach. You don't ever do that. This is like a very technical uh, mixing. Yeah. But they had these guys who wanted to help out and find this boat. And so it was a real team effort, and the Mexican officials cooperated, which meant they provided access, and they didn't restrict them from doing it. Great. But the boat was found, and, uh, and the final story I'll say is, people are asking me, where's the boat? I want to fish it because it's probably a really good structure. Oh, and right. I say, I'm not giving you those coordinates. Yeah, that's, but, but if you I drive, know. but if you drive through the area, you can smell the diesel. Oh, we still people don't know where it is. Yeah, uh, specifically, some of the local uh, pongueros do because they want to avoid it, and the, and the commercial guys will have it marked. Don't don't go near this area. But you can kind of smell. Yeah, the, you can kind of smell the diesel as it, as it gently leaks out of the boat. Pat, we and, didn't get to half of. I mean, I wanted to talk about hiking at Catalina. I wanted to talk about so many other things. Yeah. This. Hour and a half, Steve. Right, uh, flew by. Oh, let's do another four. We'll, get, well, we're, gonna have to do, we're gonna have to have you come back. I know how valuable your time is. I, I appreciate you coming all the way down here to do it. It's good to see you, my friend, and yeah. I can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you for the invitation. For all really, I appreciate one. it. And I followed your stories in China, and it was thank uh, you. fabulous. I was looking vicariously through you. Oh, great! Uh, thank and, you. And you. And you look great. Thank you. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do the hike. But if you don't come on this hike, on this hike. Maybe we'll do one next year. Maybe I'll meet you in Gonzaga Bay one of these times. Oh, you got me so fired up over <laughs> Max 5 in Gonzaga I, I, Bay. I'm, go I'm going back. But thanks again for having me. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Freeman Adventures. Once again, remember to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Bass Bros is our freshwater division. Pat McDonald, what a glorious hour and a half we spent with him. Once again, Pat, always good to see you. My pleasure. Don't forget, buy Rich Holland the top shelf vodka. Oh, he doesn't drink anymore. Uh, well, the top shelf water. <laughs> <laughs>